COVID crisis has been a terrible shock. Uh, it has been unexpected. It has been brutal. It's been devastating, both on our health systems, but also on our economies. In light of this traumatic experience, I would like to ask a few questions about the resilience of our competitive market system, the market system on which we have relied over the last three or four decades to promote economic welfare throughout the world. And I would like to make five observations. The first one is the fact that in a time of crisis, markets tend to act sluggishly. A number of countries were desperate for masks, or they were desperate for respirators, or they were desperate for the chemicals that are needed to test for the disease. But they didn't have production facility. They were relying on mostly China uh, uh, to produce those goods and to deliver them to all markets. And it turned out to be a very sluggish response the reason for it being that the good part of China was under confinement and that those industries could not deliver. So that should alert us to the fact that there are circumstances where we can't entirely rely on markets to deliver the goods that we're hoping for. Uh, maybe we need to have stocks. I will come back to this. The second observation has to do with globalization. Globalization has been a source of great advances, economic advances in the world. Hundreds of millions of people have been taken out of poverty thanks to globalization. But globalization, of course, makes us more dependent of the countries with which we trade. And this came to a dramatic uh, point during the COVID crisis because it turned out that a number of countries, particularly in Western Europe, had in fact outsourced all of their production of pharmaceutical products in China. And when China went into a lockdown, they were themselves unable to get the medicine or the medical equipment that they needed. So we've always known that uh, with globalization comes interdependence. But we've seen that there are cases where this interdependence has to be mitigated, uh, maybe, and so that we have to think about how far we want to go before we allow uh, this interdependence. How much do we want to lose our own national sovereignty? My third observation has to do with rationality. Economies tend to believe that people behave rationally, um, behavioral economists have told us that this is not always true, that sometimes intuition uh, replaces uh, thinking uh, to inform our decisions. What we have seen during the crisis is that at the public policy level, the same phenomenon occurs. When the crisis hit, there were people dying in hospitals, but there was no time to run the scientific experiments that would have told us which would be the most appropriate drugs to try to fight the virus. So in those cases, scientific thinking was too slow. At the same time, governments had to act, and they acted on their intuition in a non-scientific manner. So we should not overstate the importance of uh, logical thinking, and we should acknowledge the fact that there are both private and public policy decisions which are made using different mechanisms, mechanisms which are more prone to errors, but allow you to go faster when uh, thinking becomes a luxury that you don't have. The third dimension that I would want to mention is the importance of having a dynamic look of the world. Economies, particularly economies who are interested in competition or micro, microeconomics, tend to look at how at, a, at the world in a static way, how to improve the allocation of resources today, how to make the best of what we have today. Okay. But when the crisis hit, we saw that the options that we had they were very much dependent on past choices, choices which had been made many governments ago to stockpile masks or not to stockpile masks. Well, in countries where you had stockpiles of masks 
or stockpiles of vaccines or stockpiles of the chemicals that you needed uh, uh, for testing. In those countries, it was possible to have a strategy of confinement only for the people who were at risk of infecting other people. In countries which did not have those, because many years ago they decided not to invest in those stockpiles, uh, there was no way to separate the people who could be uh, uh, could have the virus from the people who didn't have the virus, and as a result, the whole population had to be confined, which of course came at a much higher cost from the point of view of the economy. So what this tells us is that we have to think about the fact that when we make decisions today, there are dynamic effects that are going to be uh, uh, felt tomorrow or the day after tomorrow or in the distant future. And we should think ahead, both in terms of what do we want to plan for and how many resources do we want to devote to preventing harm that could happen uh, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Maybe there hasn't been enough thinking about this because there was an over-reliance on the fact that markets would instantaneously um, meet our demands. My last point has to do with competition policy and competition law enforcement. And there I want to make a distinction between the very short run, the medium run and the long run. In the very short run today, what we need are two things. We need to be able to eliminate price gouging one, and we need to make sure that for those products which are very scarce that we all need, they are distributed in the most effective way to the people who most need them. Now, this may require cooperation or collaboration between firms uh, to ensure that the products are not wasted and that they are, in fact, uh, distributed in the best possible way. So this is a bit of a change of perspective for competition authorities because they traditionally don't like a to intervene on prices. Uh, and when you're dealing with a problem of price gouging, you have to intervene on prices. And B, because they are very wary usually of any form of cooperation between firms. So, so we have to draw the line between what is a positive cooperation and what is an anti-competitive uh, cooperation. If we look at the middle run, we are going to have a lot of firms that are going to be on the verge of bankruptcy. And governments are very keen on keeping employment up, keeping the firms running, so that when the situation is better, once the uh, confinement is over, then we can restart the economic machine as fast as possible. So there is going to be a tension there between state aid, on the one hand, to try to preserve uh, the economic system as it is, um, and be the desire to make sure that competitive market mechanism eliminate the underperformers and reward the uh, better performers. Um, uh, we've already had gone through something like this, which was in 2008 uh, after the financial crisis, but now it is uh, again the same issue not only in the uh, financial sector, but in all sectors of economic activities. Now, if we look at the long run, there's a third dimension. In the long run, we already, before the crisis started, we already needed massive reallocation of resources. And there were two major reasons. One of them was climate change. So we needed to reorient technology towards clean technologies. And the second one was the emergence of the digital economy, which required that new technology be adopted in uh, processes uh, and that therefore there should be investment in those new technologies. We now have a third uh, reason to want a massive reallocation of resources because we found out that it was not wise to have outsourced some of our industries entirely abroad. Uh, and I'm thinking, for example, which is the most obvious example about the pharmaceutical industry, that we should repatriate some capacity of production domestically so that if there is an urgent need, if there is a new pandemic, then we will be better prepared to try to answer and produce either the medicine or the test that we need uh, to fight this pandemic. So we have more reallocation resources to make, to do. And for this, we know that markets work 
very slowly. I'm not sure we have the time to wait. And in fact, what we probably need is industrial policy to help with this reallocation of resources. Of course, we want an industrial policy which is consistent with competition policy. So this is the agenda for the future. Thank you very much.